Welcome to the Expanding Worlds podcast. I'm your host, Deborah Caldo. This week, we're talking to Julia, who is involved in providing housing for people with additional needs. She's a mainstream landlord as such, but also some of her houses are rented out to people with additional needs. So we're going to talk to her about what, how that's come about, what it means, and some of the challenges that she's faced, and also the good parts of it. Welcome, Julia. So tell us a little bit about your personal background and the motivation for getting involved with housing for young people with additional needs. I am mother to a 13-year-old with a profound speech and language disorder, so didn't have a background in housing as such. I recently became buy-to-let landlord. I have approximately 25 properties and didn't plan to do a bit for society or anything actually fell into having one house with three down syndromes adults in it it wasn't a, a deliberate business ploy they approached our agent and that's really how it all started but the more we thought about it as a couple the more it seemed to make sense to give these people an opportunity do you know anything about how long the people that approach the agent had been looking um, in fact one of the tenants had lived independently previously not with the people he's now living with in our house that had broken up for a variety of reasons I understand they had been looking for a while and my understanding from the family is that actually the hardest bit of the whole process was physically finding a house. I suspect it's probably quite a traumatic thing. The three sets of parents would go and look round a property, not always with the young people, and quite often they would offer on the spot and get told, oh, we'll call you back the minute it was made clear what their needs were and never hear anything again. So I know that they looked at a lot of properties, offered on a lot of properties, and didn't get anywhere. I think, honestly, landlords have a choice. They can take your normal family and they probably do have to think slightly outside the box. Why do they think, I'd rather have someone else and not someone with additional needs? Lack of understanding, if you're going to put it generally. I think it boils down to not knowing what the pitfalls are, not being sure, and quite frankly, there are normal alternatives. Nothing sticks on the market for very long. I take a risk when you when you don't have to and landlords are in it. It's a business for them and why create additional work? Lots of landlords don't like sharers. These special people will always be sharers. They're genuinely not couples or families. Lots of landlords will also stipulate no DHS, no council funded. So lots of landlords categorically say no to that up front, which would obviously exclude these types of people. So yeah, it's the sharers, no DHS payments. On top of that, the other barrier for the parents and the young people is that genuinely you know, they don't have paid employment so they will fundamentally fail a credit check they possibly have never had a bank account you know they're not like the average teenager that goes out with a debit card from the minute it turns 15 16 and is you know into itunes and paying for everything they, they probably haven't had your, your normal framework so if they've not got a bank account they don't have a credit history. So credit reference checking them, they will almost certainly fail that because they haven't got a lot of credit cards, they haven't got a car loan, and all those things that build up your credit history. So when you go to reference check them, obviously, you know, it's 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 ID, current address, you know, birth certificates, what have you, and passports, they probably have all of those. But the minute you get to the credit reference check, they are almost certainly gonna fail it. And most landlords will say, I don't touch people who fail a credit reference check. Well, I think you have to look at why people have failed a credit reference check, but why should a landlord go out of its way to consider them? You probably employ an agency to, to do all these reference checking for you and their ability to you know, rent within the UK and all these new rules. Why make an exception? They fail a credit reference check and they're a normal person, you wouldn't touch them. So I suspect that that's the other one that they will all struggle on. So for us, it was, you know, do they understand the agreement and are we happy to take somebody that will effectively fail a credit reference check? You do all the other checks and, and in fact, I don't think the house I have even went through the credit reference check. It seemed pointless. Um, they were quite upfront about their bank account situations and we, we left it at that. The other thing on top of that, the 
genuinely in circumstances like that, landlords will expect a much higher deposit. So you're then immediately disadvantaged. So uh, for the house I have, I actually have a full month deposit versus a standard one and a half month deposit. The other way around it is to offer a larger upfront payment. So I think we had something like additional four months paid in advance. Obviously, once it's been running a while, that then disappears. So that the cash needs seen you know, for the parent funding the young person or the local authority funding that young person, the upfront cash costs are higher than for your normal tenant coming in. They've suddenly got to find four months deposit rather than one and a half months deposit. Obviously, that's at the landlord's discretion. And I suspect it was actually the parents that suggested that formula. I never requested it. I suspect they probably offered it, not knowing us and not wanting to lose another house. I think with hindsight, it must have been very difficult. You don't take three 25-year-olds round a property and another property and another property and, you know, try and explain to them that they could live here and this could be your bedroom and the living carer would live in this bedroom overnight and to then have them cut down and be disappointed repeatedly and repeatedly. I suspect what the parents end up doing is going around house after house after house and not taking the young people because you can't put them through that level of disappointment. It it must be frustrating enough as a parent, least of all as the person concerned. And understanding that rejection is very hard for some of these people they will take it more personally or they won't simply won't understand it do parents know each other uh yes this set of parents definitely do and it is one particular parent that has instigated it and organized it and done it all uh, effectively privately this particular house is three adults currently all male we have had one change of tenant but that's standard i would have other houses with sharers where one will go and a new one will come in so that's nothing unusual in the buy to let market who found that tenant they found that tenant and generally that's how it works so we had a six-week period where there was only two of them in the house and they covered the additional rent because all three are equally and severally liable within the law for the rent so what about the ongoing challenges is there anything different about having young people with additional needs as opposed to other types of tenants yes no i think every set of tenants we have are very different Uh, You get some that you never hear from and some that are on the phone every five minutes. So there is a huge variety out there anyway. With regard to this particular house, no, I wouldn't say that I get any more or less. I have the parents are extremely grateful and understanding and the easiest of actually all my tenants to deal with. If I was completely honest, they do have downs and one of those issues is that they tend to be quite heavy handed. So it's silly things like, you know, sliding covered doors coming off tracks perhaps they pulled on the curtain pole a bit too much but you'd be surprised what the average five-year-old can do so it's not radically different to a normal house and a normal setup personally the advantage are they don't tend to drink they don't tend to smoke they don't tend to have two dogs and two cats and they don't tend to have toddlers drawing on walls and five-year-olds plastering mum up to the walls. So generally, I think the houses are kept in better condition and it's actually much easier. I have one single point of contact generally. Well, it's quite well, it's quite easy. I'd have said it's probably one of my lower maintenance properties. Personally, I think it's it's great. They, they have a live-in house manager. I think they have five that rotate throughout the week that is there from sort of 3.30 in the afternoon till 9am the following morning. And that house manager is responsible for sort of everything, from making sure that they do go to bed, doors are locked, they, they shower, they do have routines up as to who clears the kitchen, who does housework, who empties the dishwasher, who does the garden. Exactly how you would ideally want a shared house to be run. And the house parent, did you say house manager? I guess you call it a house manager, yeah. And they're and they're paid for by they are paid for by the, the parents. So it's described to me that the uh, the the parents effectively receive three pots of money. One is 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 a housing allowance, another is a staffing allowance, and the third pot is really the disability uh, living allowance and sort of other ad hoc allowances that they may get. And those three pots combined 
are adequate to to fund the rent, the staffing of the house, and for them to do cinema or nightclubs or what they wish to do or swimming or no, my understanding is that none of the three have paid employment. They do have somewhere that they they spend four days a week. Uh, the fifth day is generally spent in the house, and they have almost like a PA that comes in and does their admin with them, make sure they change their beds. And that's goes, not the house manager. Uh, no, no, it doesn't seem to be. My understanding is that the house manager is a rotation of five staff in the evenings, whereas they have a separate person with them during the day that drives them to their activities, what have you. And again, that's all funded out of those pots that don't necessarily spend all day together. Uh, so four days a week they tend to be out of the house. The fifth day in the house doing house chores, the way the rest of us was. Uh, and I understand that these guys actually tend to spend the weekends with their parents. Not always, but quite often will go home on Saturday and Sunday. So in terms of, you, you've said lots of reasons why landlords wouldn't do it. Is there something that inspires you to sort of think this is something that I'm glad I've done it now? Feedback from... Yeah, definitely. I'd almost positively discriminate, <laughs> I suppose is the best way of phrasing it. I have a set of eternally grateful parents, which is is very rewarding in itself. They're very understanding, they are very responsive, very appreciative. I think it's fantastic that it's working and they, they have now been in coming up three years. Personally, from a landlord point of view, three years in a single property with no break is obviously financially ideal. That's what you want. You don't want huge turnovers, a huge vacant period. I certainly don't consider them to, to cost me more on a day-to-day -day basis with queries and issues than any other. I suspect that they will continue to be long-term tenants. If you look at the, the demographic of these people, they are not going to be in a position to buy, so they will be long-term tenants. And actually, as a landlord, that's absolutely ideal. That, that's, what, that's what you're looking for. That's what your business model wants. You don't want them vacating every six months and doing a runner. It doesn't, doesn't pay. The issue I find is that actually there aren't many out there that, that want this. There are obviously various other alternatives for these people. A lot of them are privately companies that organise housing within almost like an estate but they are run for profit and I think probably end up feeling a bit more like residential care than really living in your own house on a normal street, you know, with your own car parking spot and your own little back garden and actually having to pay bills and really be independent and shop for yourself. You're not within a, a special needs community you are actually living on a normal street. Do you think that's a big advantage for them then? I think so. My understanding is that there's one particular boy that actually wanted and asked to live independently. He instigated this. It was not the parents' desire, you know, initial desire. He's got to live independently and he's got to live on, you know, Coronation Street kind of thing. Um, he actually wanted himself uh, to move on like his brother and sister had and to live independently. And actually, I think that is what my daughter is going to want. She thinks she's normal, so she wouldn't want to not be living in a house. Well, the having a laugh is, with her mates. Normal? So, well, yeah. It's always a question. <laughs> well, I think normal is still living with your parents at 40 these days, isn't it? <laughs> in that case, she won't be normal, will she? <laughs> no, she might be the abnormal one. <laughs> so you said you can't, there's no one... Would you do more houses like yes, this? Yes, definitely. And I've spoken to the agent and said I would actively seek them out. I'm saying here I want to do more of these and very happy to consider it. And as I say, to let those things go, credit reference, the whole tenancy agreement, that whole worry, the whole deposit issue, the upfront payments, I'm quite happy to negotiate and be open. And they said, well, in fact, the house you've got is the only house we've approached, which does surprise me slightly. I, I can't think why maybe too many parents of these people find the whole idea of trying to organise it and set it up and keep it running a slightly terrifying prospect as well. Possibly they don't want them to live independently and they don't want 
to take that risk and push them out. Or could it be the assumption that they won't find anywhere? Because as you said, those parents have had a long and arduous journey. Yes, I, sus- I suspect, I suspect, as you say, it's probably a mixture of everything. If it was me, then yes, I would be sitting there in the evenings thinking of the barriers rather than the wonderful idea that it is. I would be sitting there thinking, this is going to be tougher than I'm ex- expecting. And the disappointment element as well, because if you were to put that to your son or daughter and say this is an option if you then can't deliver that seems like an ongoing issue with our kids Mm. in my view that feels like a daily battle if I'm honest you think you can do something for them and actually when push comes to shove you can't you know from trying to set up a bank account to arranging accommodation or Mm. schooling but they are more out of your control than than with a normal but to be fair what you're doing shows it can be done oh yes absolutely and actually when push came to shove it was relatively straightforward you know it all went through fine there were no delays they moved in when they wanted and as I say I would happily do again and be open to different suggestions I think it does take one very proactive parent to take sort of control of the situation and you know somebody has to organize that staffing and as far as I'm aware in this circumstance it is done by the parent and not the local authority so somebody's got to do that recruiting payroll issue somebody has got to sort that and possibly that feels like quite a burden that doesn't seem right because actually I think there's a, there's a huge benefit. I mean, all our houses are within walking distance of a train station, a mainline train station. All of them are within walking distance of a supermarket. And on bus routes are well placed. So I would say that almost all our properties are ideal for this. What they obviously do need in this circumstances is, 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 some, is, is almost a box room for that house manager overnight. So, you know, if it's a four-bedroom house and it has this little nursery, then that effectively is the house manager's room overnight. So you are then looking at sharing the cost between three rather than four. For what is ostensibly a four-bedroom yes. house. Yes. But it, it does mean that the box room and the nursery does lend itself to this situation. And obviously, a lot of the property around here, some of the old property there are a lot of box rooms out there, so I don't see why not. I suspect the bigger issue is that, you know, in order to make it sense, you do need four or five bedrooms rather than two or three bedrooms. My understanding is that they thoroughly enjoy the independence and living with their mates, just like any other 20-something-year-old would do. Perfect. So without the parties? <laughs> well, apparently well, not. <laughs> I can't see any evidence of it, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> So finally, just some advice. What would you say to parents of young people looking for accommodation? My advice, I think, would be don't dismiss the private sector. My understanding is that the money is there, if you apply for it correctly, to make this happen. I think as far as approaching letting agents and for them to then approach their landlords on their books, I'd be quite open and upfront about it from the very start so make it clear why they're not going to get through a credit reference check be completely open up front and and effectively only put yourself through and go and see properties where landlords are aware up front and happy to accommodate you there isn't any point wasting 40 minutes every Saturday looking at house after house after house if you're going to fail the DHS or credit reference or whatever test it is that landlord considers absolute paramount for them to feel happy and comfortable. I think if you approached private landlords in a sensible, well thought out way and just were honest, I, I, I personally don't see any reason why you make a better or worse tenant. Certainly not in our personal experience. It's, it's been highly successful and would happily do it again. For us, it's actually finding them. It's who to approach to say, hey, we have this housing stock, would you be interested? It's short of actually approaching the local autistic units or whatever, um, or going to the local authority, in our case, Kent County Council, it would be quite hard to physically advertise ourselves and make yourself visible and available. Thank you, Julia, for those useful insights into your experiences as a landlord. 
So, the key takeaways from this podcast? Well, to me as a parent, it's to persevere and to keep believing that there's someone out there willing to do things a little bit differently. So if you're looking for a rental property, go out, approach agents and be upfront about what you need. And another takeaway is to plan ahead in terms of things like a credit score. And I'll certainly be looking at ways I can make sure my daughter actually has a good credit score as she gets older. And finally, a key takeaway if you're lucky enough to have any investment property is to think outside the box. You can see that all types of tenants on their merits, not just their credit scores. As always, if you could leave a podcast review, that would be great. And if you have any recommendations for guests or for topics you want me to talk more about, then you can message me on Instagram or Facebook at Deborah Caldo, or you can email podcast at expandingworlds.com.